Welcome to Diary of an Unemployed Actor with me, Milo Dennison. Today, I am joined by Neil Cohen, who is a uh, playwright, a screenwriter, a producer. Uh, is there anything you don't do, I guess, is really the better um, way of introducing uh, you. Uh, well, prominent in that list should be unemployed. So oh, uh, perfect. It, it, it fits in uh, perfectly, yeah. <laughs> Great, We're right with the title there. Yeah. Yeah, so you're primarily, would you say you're primarily a writer? Primarily a writer. That's okay. how I've been able to make some stumble bum living as a writer over the last few decades. Nice. Well, let's start with that then. So uh, what got you in a writer? Were you a, a big uh, creative writer as a child or was that something later on in life? Yes. Yeah, I mean, as a child, actually, my obsession was uh, creating clay figures and doing these vast scenarios with hundreds of little clay figures I would uh, build in our apartment, which was a tiny apartment in Queens, New York. And when I look back on it, it's uh, quite amazing because uh, we were a family of four, me and my older brother in one room, my parents in another room. My father was kind of a tough guy. He was an ex-professional boxer. Oh, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, him and his brothers had a weird the toy store down on the Lower East Side. He had a broken nose. His face was covered with scars, which I thought most dads had. But he was the sweetest guy in the world. And he would like tiptoe around these <laughs> massive scenarios of clay that I would create. Now, in those days, there was no such thing as stop motion. Had I have known about that even, you know, even with eight millimeter or whatnot, that may have been a whole other trajectory in my life. But, uh, uh, it, you know, I think like a lot, well, not like a lot of people, but like some people who have an artistic bent and grow up not in a milieu of artists, it's very difficult to call yourself an artist. It, and, and that became sort of a, a long sort of emotional struggle with me. I thought I'd be a history teacher, quite frankly, because calling myself an artist seemed to be like the weirdest I couldn't get it out of my mouth, you know, to say. Were, was, were your parents kind of encouraging you to go like, you know, down a certain path like uh, parents my sometimes My parents do? had a very tough upbringing. And as opposed to the sort of uh, the people who have a tough upbringing and say you should have a tough upbringing, their whole mantra was just find something and be happy. Mm. Try, to have, try to have a happy life. So, uh, so, so there was actually no, it was left to me to come up with my direction, actually. And then I suppose in high school and college and after college, I, I found that my happy spot was writing, was sitting in a room alone writing. Um, of course, uh, being a bartender and a waiter and a busboy and all those, you know, working in bookshops. I mean, that's how I made a living until I could figure out a way to actually start selling any writing. But uh, uh, and, and it wasn't until I actually started selling stuff that I could call myself a writer, but, uh, what was uh, the first thing you sold? The first thing I sold was a, um, was a very strange script that turned into a very terrible movie. Uh, it was called pass the ammo. It was a comedy that, uh, that took place, uh, among televangelists who were, uh, uh, taken hostage um, by a bunch of people who were just looking to rob a safe and didn't even know the show was going on in the other room. And next thing, these robbers are on this televangelist show. Uh, it should have been wonderful. It wasn't, but I got a paycheck. And, and that was rather extraordinary. How did you uh, how did you sell it? Like, did you find the producers of the film? And like, I'm curious, kind of that process, especially. Well, it was a spec script that I had written with a, a buddy of mine. We had done some uh, uh, a plays we wrote this uh, and and literally one of these just chance meetings with somebody so i had a chance meeting with a very eccentric cat i don't remember his name but he was one of the writers of revenge of the nerds ah classic <laughs> and, he, and he had partnered up he was like the fresh young producer who had partnered up with a very old, old Hollywood producer who was still knocking around in the 70s. And uh, this guy, Miguel, I remember his first name, um, read the script, liked it, brought it into the guy, and uh, it, it was sold like 
right away. So I thought, oh, this is going to be the greatest career. I'm going to sell things all the time. Uh, you know, my, my previous experience of being excited as a writer was when I was in college, I did a spec script. And in those days, there was, of course, no internet, but people would take ads and the, you know, the weekly sort of underground magazines. And one said, looking for scripts. And I uh, mailed these people a script and they told me how much they loved it. And I uh, ran up to a, a, a building to meet them in North Hollywood. And the building didn't exist and the address didn't exist. So this was some strange person who put ads out and people would send them scripts and it didn't exist, which is not, it seemed very weird, but in Hollywood and in the world of unemployed actors and unemployed writers, that's kind of a thing that happens. So it wasn't like a scam, like he was trying to get scripts that he could then try to like pass off as his own or he, like he was legit, just didn't I, have a location. I have no idea. I, I oh. remember it. Let me tell the story because now it's even better. <laughs> I went up there and met the guy and I met the guy and it was in it. it his was the only open office in like a two story place with a parking lot in front that they have in the San Fernando Valley. And the guy was older than me. Yeah, I was in my 20s. He was in his late 30s. So he seemed like a super grown up. And he was in whatever the Hollywood outfit of the time was, probably blue jeans, a white shirt, no socks and loafers and a suntan. And he seemed very real. And there was all kinds of busyness in the office. And the, he said, we're going to make this movie. We're going to send you an offer. This is a great movie. It was a post-apocalyptic script that nobody was making in those days. Um, and then I didn't hear from him two weeks, and I went back in two weeks, and there was no building there. <laughs> there was no building, no trace of a guy. And um, that's, uh, that's an experience I've had in some way, shape, or form many times. Wow. And, and is it just he just went out of business? Just dis and, and no idea what happened to it after that. In huh? LA, one would assume mm -hmm. that it would be sort of a get shorty thing. Yeah. That people are on the fringes of the business, but a lot of people are chasing them for money. Okay. And they assume they're going to come up and pay whoever they owe the money to. And if they can't, it's not sort of a legal thing. It's a, I have to disappear sort of thing. Okay. And that happens a lot where people just literally evaporate and you find out that everyone's looking for them. And the script never got, you never were able to sell the script no, to anybody no, else no, after no, that no, or anything? No, oh, okay. No, that, that it's a, a, yeah, yeah. And then, well, you know, the, the first like paid writing gig I had was yeah. I was, um, I'd written some plays. I had the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, Chief That Boy, done Chief That Boy, wrote Chief That Boy, and that script was floating around while the movie was being cut. Okay. And uh, somebody in Hollywood saw it and liked it and showed it to a producer. And uh, the producer said, I'm flying into New York. I want to meet you. I've got a project for you. They wanted me to adopt a book, adapt the book that they had bought, uh, a funny thriller. That was a very good book. And they flew into New York, and my wife uh, gave birth to our baby two and a half weeks early on the day this person flew in from uh, Los Angeles. And I had to tell her, I, yeah, and she just hung around in a hotel for a week. And then uh, uh, I was able to function and I went to her hotel room and a uh, very elegant, uh, very smart woman named Marianne Maloney. And she opened the door and she said, man, you look like shit. Get in here. <laughs> <laughs> and she ordered me up a bottle of wine and a steak and uh, it showed up room service. And I remember taking a bite of the steak, a sip of the wine and waking up three hours later on the couch because I was wrecked. Just and wrecked from, the, there, from yeah, the baby. Yeah. Rolling yeah. Balls, you know, it was in a fancy hotel. And then she said, I oh, feel better. Okay. You know, like uh, we'll make this deal, you know, it, we'll, we'll make this thing happen. And, uh, and next thing you knew, we flew out to L.A. and uh, started a, a writing career, which was not smooth. I mean, that writing career got broken up with times I had to work in bookshops and uh, scuffle around and borrow money. And uh, 
uh, you know, at one point even auditioned for acting jobs, which was the, the most horrific thing I ever did. Um, and not because acting is horrific, but I had no, I had no business. I'm, I'm a pretty affable guy until somebody says action. And then I'm literally the deer in headlights. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Well, that's a great story. Like, I love that story with the producer, though, that she was so nice about it because you hear stories yeah. about producers and they sound like, the, you know, they're often cons referred to as like the worst people on the planet. I'll give you the flip side of the story. So now I've sold a couple of scripts and I'm, I'm back in New York and not quite sure why. And I get a call from a really big producer, somebody who works for a really big producer who says, we've read your stuff. We know your stuff. Um, we want you to come out to LA and have a meeting. The job is yours. It's terrific. And this is a very famous producer who is married to a very famous director. The meeting is going to be at her house on a Thursday afternoon at, I don't know, three o'clock in the afternoon. And they send me a plane ticket and I get on the plane. And we're flying from New York to LA and an engine explodes on the plane. And the plane has to make a crash landing in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is right in the middle of the country. I have been to Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. So, <laughs> and the pilot says to us, this is an airport that does not usually take jumbo jets. It has a very short runway. So on three engines, I'm going to be able to put us down, but then we're going to come to a very short stop. And as we're coming down, I'm looking out the window and you see it's flat. It's the prairie for miles away. Fire engines and ambulances <laughs> heading towards where we know we're going to be crash landing. I mean, dozens. Uh, they're coming from Kansas. They're coming from Nebraska. Everywhere you see fire engines and ambulances heading. Probably the most exciting thing that's happened there and you know, who knows how long. Absolutely. So the plane comes in. The guy puts it down. It rolls off the end of the runway. You know, and we're all, our heads are, the inertia is taking us into the seats in front of us. They get us off that plane real, real quick. And then they say they're going to have to put us on a bunch of small planes, which are the only things that can take off, because they're going to have to get this plane unloaded to be able to have no weight to be able to take off at some point in the next day or so. So I get on this plane again. I tell them, I got to get to this meeting. I need this job. Put me on the first plane. That, and they do. And I get to LA. And there's no cell phones in those days. This is in the, the late 80s. Uh, maybe, early, maybe there are cell phones. I don't have one. Um, and I get to the meeting. And she goes, why are you late? We've been waiting for you. I said, well, the plane crash landed in Nebraska, and I thought I was going to die. And I got on another plane. I got here as fast as I can. She said, yeah, but you're late. What the fuck is that? You're late to the meeting. <laughs> and it was the most unpleasant meeting you could, and I didn't get the job. Yeah. She just kept saying, I can't believe you show up late for this meeting. Just couldn't comprehend the whole, like, had no control over the plane landing. And oh, zero crazy. compassion. I mean, I thought I was coming in with the greatest opening story. Absolutely. You're th that's a good, like, if there's a reason to be late for something, yeah. the plane crashed is a pretty awesome reason. Pretty awesome reason. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't care less. Oh, wow. And then did you uh, fly back to New York right after that? Or were you in L.A. for a little while? Or well, After that, I flew back to New York. Yeah. <laughs> so what took you to L.A.? Uh, to or, or the west coast to live right right so i grew up in uh, at, at new york and uh, went out to ucla where i met my uh, girlfriend wife to be and uh, and she was from brooklyn so it was a perfect match and uh, when we got out of college uh, she was an artist uh, a designer and i was a writer and uh, we knew we'd have to come up with a way to make a living but neither of us had ever lived in manhattan I was in Queens. She grew up in Brooklyn. We said, let's go live in Manhattan for a little while, see what that's like. And that's the early 80s. It was crazy. You literally, it was the French Connection. If you watch the French Connection, I saw the French Connection at a revival house out here. And all these young people got up and asked, and the uh, cinematographer was there. And they said, how did you get it to look like that? 
<laughs> that just <laughs> turn on the camera. That's what it looked like. That's what it felt like. So, but the upside was you literally could get an apartment in Manhattan for $89 a month. Yeah, it was some crazy walk up in some crazy neighborhood, but that was not, oh, I can't believe you got an apartment for 89. And somebody would say, I got one for 76 a month, you know? So, um, yeah, so we lived in New York and I was doing plays and uh, working in restaurants and she got jobs. Uh, she actually became a mucky muck in the design world and became the art director of Esquire magazine. And next thing you know, we have a kid and it's like, you suddenly realize you're living in a three floor walk up tenement with rats in the hall, which you kind of thought was kind of sort of hip <laughs> until you realize you're going to have a kid <laughs> that you're going to bring into this building. Um, and at that point, both our sets of parents were living in Los Angeles. And we had had a base in Los Angeles because we had gone to UCLA. And at that point, there was absolutely no show business in New York. This was before the whole law and order era. There was no TV. There was no movies being made in New York. So, uh, and I had this agent who had read a script and said, you got to come out to LA. So we were like the Beverly Hillbillies. We packed up and headed out to LA. Yeah. Cause this was the era when like, you know, nowadays people can do anything from anywhere, but then yeah. you kind of, you had to more or less be in LA in order to make. Well, yeah. I mean, suddenly I acquired an agent. You'd had to go to mm -hmm. meetings and meet people. Everything yeah. was face to face meetings. And uh, I kind of hit there when it was the sort of hot time for people getting jobs. If you could write and you were halfway affable, you know, uh, you could get your first job. Let's put it that way. Then you could wear out your welcome really quickly also, uh, which I was stupid enough to do at a couple of locations and smart enough not to do at some other locations. <laughs> so you're over in LA, you got your agent, you're yeah. sending scripts off. Right. And um, one of those scripts is Chief Zabu. No. Okay. Chief Zabu is written in a apartment in New York. I was for uh, five, I, I wrote a play and I thought that that was going to be my key to success. It got wonderful reviews. It was in a, literally in a walk into garage in uh, the New York City downtown and an agent shows up. And he loves the play and he loves me. And I go, this is great. Uh, how can you, how can I make some money? And he says, you could start making money on Monday. Come into my office and start answering the phones. <laughs> so <laughs> I became this assistant to this agent in New York who uh, represented a bunch of Broadway and voiceover people. And I was, had no idea what I was doing there. And one day a guy named Zach Norman walks in with a guy named Robert Downey Sr., Robert Downey's father. And Robert Downey's father was a very famous and notorious independent film director. Um, and he made some very famous movies called, uh, that you might want to look up called uh, uh, Putney Swope is probably his most famous movie. And there's uh, another one uh, where Alan Arbus uh, comes down in a parachute into an old West town and claims he's Jesus Christ in the 1870s. Uh, uh, I think it's called the uh, Greaser's Palace. I'm not, anyway, there's a whole bunch of movies that Robert Downey Sr. made that okay. Zach was peripherally involved with. They were going to make a movie. They needed a certain actress. I did the deal for this actress. And walking to the elevator, Zach said, you look like the most miserable guy in the world. What's your story, man? I said, I'm so unhappy. I'm working here with a suit and tie answering phones for voiceover people. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to write scripts. He said, well, send me a script. So he, I sent him a script I had written. He liked it. He said, well, why don't you quit that job? Come work for me. And Zach was doing all kinds of weird real estate deals and film financing. So we started working together and we were working on scripts together. And uh, one day he tells me the story of uh, a, a few years previous. He had been summoned to a hotel suite on Fifth Avenue to meet a guy named Chief Kapoor, 
who was the leader of Namibia, which was trying to get its independence from South Africa. And Chief uh, Kapu had shown up in New York to meet with the UN to try to cement his nation's independence from South Africa. So they said, maybe you could raise some money for the guy, Zach, uh, come over to this hotel suite. And Zach shows up and this poor man in a business suit is surrounded by every shark, con man, and hustler in New York. And for some reason, Warren Beatty and Elizabeth Taylor. Wow. <laughs> and Zach took one look at the guy in the situation and said, this poor man is doomed and <laughs> just made a U-turn and left that hotel room. That poor man, a few months later, was assassinated. Now, before he gets assassinated, it's a pretty funny story to me. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty good movie. The Hustler is trying to take over a third world country. These new, But we can't set it in Namibia. But literally at the time he's telling me the story, a number of French colonies in the South Pacific were vying for independence. And some of them were South Pacific islands where the French were testing nuclear weapons in the open air. So I said, that's kind of funny. <laughs> South Pacific islands where these hustlers want to get involved, thinking Pago Pago, Tahiti beaches, and have no idea that the French are dropping atomic bombs on these islands. So we said, that's a movie we could write and we could direct together if you, Zach, come up with some money. So uh, we write the script, we dig the script, he closes some real estate deal. And before he could put it into something else, I browbeat him into saying, we should direct this movie together. We should make this movie right now before this money evaporates. There was some hundred thousand dollars in change or something that he had. So you're over in LA, you got your agent, you're yeah. sending scripts off. Right. And um, one of those scripts is Chief Zabu. No. Okay. Chief Zabu is written in a apartment in New York. I was for uh, five, I, I wrote a play and I thought that that was going to be my key to success. It got wonderful reviews. It was in a, literally in a walk into garage in uh, the New York City downtown. And an agent shows up and he loves the play and he loves me. And I go, this is great. Uh, how can you, how can I make some money? And he says, you could start making money on Monday. Come into my office and start answering the phones. <laughs> so <laughs> I became this assistant to this agent in New York who uh, represented a bunch of Broadway and voiceover people. And I was, had no idea what I was doing there. And one day, a guy named Zach Norman walks in with a guy named Robert Downey Sr., Robert Downey's father. And Robert Downey's father was a very famous and notorious independent film director. Um, and he made some very famous movies called, uh, that you might want to look up called uh, uh, Putney Swope is probably his most famous movie. And there's uh, another one uh, where Alan Arbus uh, comes down in a parachute into an old West town and claims he's Jesus Christ in the 1870s. Uh, uh, I think it's called the uh, Greaser's Palace. I'm not, anyway, there's a whole bunch of movies that Robert Downey Sr. made that okay. Zach was peripherally involved with. They were going to make a movie. They needed a certain actress. I did the deal for this actress. And walking to the elevator, Zach said, you look like the most miserable guy in the world. What's your story, man? I said, I'm so unhappy. I'm working here with a suit and tie answering phones for voiceover people. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to write scripts. He said, well, send me a script. So he, I sent him a script I had written. He liked it. He said, well, why don't you quit that job? Come work for me. And Zach was doing all kinds of weird real estate deals and film financing. So we started working together and we were working on scripts together. And one day he tells me the story of uh, a, a few years previous. He had been summoned to a hotel suite on Fifth Avenue to meet a guy named Chief Kapu, 
who was the leader of Namibia, which was trying to get its independence from South Africa. And Chief uh, Kapu had shown up in New York to meet with the UN to try to cement his nation's independence from South Africa. So they said, maybe you could raise some money for the guys that uh, come over to this hotel suite. And Zach shows up and this poor man in a business suit is surrounded by every shark, con man, and hustler in New York. And for some reason, Warren Beatty and Elizabeth Taylor. Wow. <laughs> and Zach took one look at the guy in the situation and said, this poor man is doomed. And <laughs> just made a U-turn and left that hotel room. That poor man, a few months later, was assassinated. Now, before he gets assassinated, it's a pretty funny story to me. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty good movie. The hustlers trying to take over a third world country. These new, but we can't set it in Namibia. But literally at the time he's telling me the story, a number of French colonies in the South Pacific were vying for independence. And some of them were South Pacific islands where the French were testing nuclear weapons in the open air. So I said, that's kind of funny. <laughs> South Pacific islands where these hustlers want to get involved, thinking Pago Pago, Tahiti beaches, and have no idea that the French are dropping atomic bombs on these islands. So we said, that's a movie we could write and we could direct together if you, Zach, come up with some money. So uh, we write the script, we dig the script, he closes some real estate deal, and before he could put it into something else, I browbeat him into saying, we should direct this movie together. We should make this movie right now before this money evaporates. There's some $100,000 in change or something that he had. So, so Zach funded the film. Yeah, yeah, he funded the film. I mean, Zach, was has financed, produced, executive produced something like forty movies. Okay, uh, some uh, everything from horror movies to he f he financed the release of the great anti-war documentary Hearts and Minds, which won the nineteen seventy four Academy Award for best documentary, um, and some say was instrumental in ending the Vietnam War. A picture directed by uh, Peter Davis. So. Um, he knew his way around uh, uh, raising money for films, producing films, uh, acting in films, but not directing one, nor did I. Okay, so he had never directed part of this. He, he just acted. Was this, sorry, because I know Zach, so Zach Norman is who we're talking about. Right, yeah, uh, who, Sitting Ducks and with Jaglum and all those. Yeah, uh, Romancing the Stone is. Romancing the Stone, Cadillac yeah. Man with Robin Williams. Yeah, Cadillac Man is another one. So that's who we're talking about. Exactly. So. Uh, uh, we put together, uh, uh, you know, a plan to shoot this thing, and we moved forward to shoot it, not knowing that when you're first-time directors and you have 15 days to shoot a movie, it's not supposed to have 43 speaking roles take place in 23 locations, purportedly in three cities and two continents. <laughs> so uh, we shot this uh, entire movie with it, it was quite a scramble and we shot it on a college campus. Uh, uh, the guy who was our line producer uh, knew the maintenance man at Bard College <laughs> and uh, we uh, spread a couple of bucks around and next thing you know between sessions we were able to shoot the movie on the campus of Bard which is up the Hudson River from New York two hours and part of the deal was uh, we had to have 23 student interns working on the movie. So uh, in well, that's something good. That's, that- That's free labor though, perfect. Well, it was, and in, in a, something that would absolutely not be able to exist today, the 23 student interns and the entire cast and crew stayed together in bunk beds in the dorms. <laughs> <laughs> And we all ate at the cafeteria together. Okay. And everyone was very well behaved, but it was literally something from a Marx Brothers movie. Um, and so the movie purportedly takes place in Manhattan. We spent the two days in Manhattan shooting exteriors, and people would walk in entrances with no permits. I mean, we uh, walk into the Plaza Hotel, and then the scene would be someplace in an interior at Bard College, or you'd 
walk into a real estate office and the interior would be at Bard College. At one point, we sent two people, two actors, into the French embassy and told them, walk in and then come out. Because uh, the scene, you know, was going to be shot. And they walked in and they didn't come out. <laughs> they didn't come out for 20 minutes. So we had to go in and they were being interrogated by uh, French intelligence officers. <laughs> and we had to <laughs> drag them out of this uh, building. So, uh, yeah, so we made this movie and it was kind of uh, a, a pretty crazy and pretty shaggy. And, uh, uh, in those days, the movie had to be 90 minutes to get distribution, and we didn't have a great 90 minutes, but we had uh, 90 minutes, and uh, we slapped that together. Found the distributor actually did like it, was about to put it out, and then he went bankrupt. And so the movie fell into this bankruptcy thing, which took years and years for us to extricate from. So it was tied up in the bankruptcy, which yeah. is why you couldn't then go and try to find another distributor for it. Exactly, exactly. Because all the creditors wanted a piece of it, and it, you know, it, it it becomes a whole lawyer thing. By the time we got it back, I was already out in Los Angeles. Zach was on to a whole lot of other things, and when we would talk about re-editing the film, in those days, re-editing a film meant hiring an editor with a moviola in a room that would cost $200 a day or $200 an hour, which we didn't have. the days of film. Like, yeah, yeah. With sliding film across, you know, and, and oh, actually it was totally placing. mechanical, you know, uh, Luddite era, you know, with, and believe it or not, the movie was shot on 35 millimeter. So the space it takes to edit a 35 millimeter film, it was shot on... 35 minutes. This may not have any re relevance to your audience, but it was shot on a thing called short ends. So short ends were the leftover films from the reels that reel productions, movies, TV shows, you'd have a nine minute reel. You'd have 30 seconds at the end of the reel. You weren't going to do a new setup and then have to check. You would cut that off, reload it, and then you'd cut the short end and sell it back to the lab. Uh -huh. The lab would then use these short ends that they would sell to film students or experimental filmmakers. And sometimes you'd get a minute long. Sometimes you'd get a minute and a half of a short end. Sometimes you'd get 45 seconds. Sometimes you'd get... To... So we shot the whole movie on 35 millimeter short ends, except we had one reel that was nine minutes long, which we used for this uncut driving scene, which I think that you may have seen. Uh, which is uh, a piece of pure cinema because we loaded a camera, bolted it onto the hood of a car, a, a convertible, and sent these guys up the road with a mic and a, and, and a briefcase, and there was no cameraman, <laughs> director, sound man. These guys just drove up the road and did their scene. Yeah, so that scene, uh, it, it's fascinating too, because, yeah, you can tell that, that the camera's on the front of the car, yeah. As they're, so I was curious what they did. So the microphone was in the vehicle with them. It's in a briefcase behind where they're sitting, yeah. Uh, and so if they only had nine minutes to do that scene, did they have to get it right in one take? Or Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was, they did two takes of about five, five. One was five, one was four minutes each. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just essentially let, I think, the four or five minute take run because you're watching two actors at the top of their game. Um, Alan was a guy from the actor studio, would do a lot of improv, but would do a lot of improv of, okay, let's start it over, let's start it over, let's, and I think my only piece of direction that meant anything in the whole film, because I knew Alan, he was a character I knew, I said, man, you can't do that fucking actor studio shit, man, you gotta <laughs> just like, stay in the scene, follow wherever Zach takes you, and you can't break scene, he said, I gotcha, gotcha, okay. and he didn't know what Zach was going to throw him. That wasn't fully scripted then. No, what was scripted was they're going to go up and get the money, and uh, what if the guy doesn't have the money? Okay. And then it was Zach, take it from there, and Alan's going to follow. He's neurotic, he's uptight, he's sure he's going to get this money, and you throw everything at him that's going to put this guy into a hole, you nice. know? And, and Alan's actually driving the car. <laughs> So there's no tow car, there's no cranes, there's no, I mean, it's, it's guys driving a car up the road with no one around and they're making this scene happen. I mean, we were, I was in the back of a station wagon 
uh, the maybe 50 yards or 70 yards ahead so that nobody would get in front of them and slow down their pace. Mm. And I was there with the cameraman and uh, the cameraman uh, gave me a set of binoculars. So I'm looking and I go to the cameraman. This is how naive I am, you know, first time director. I said, am I supposed to look through the binoculars into the eyepiece to see what's <laughs> going on? He says, no, you're supposed to see if you could see the counter on the camera and tell me when it stops. <laughs> nice. And did you guys only have one camera? So like if this camera broke, then you're... Yeah, that was it. We had one big 35 millimeter camera. Yeah. Um, so there was no way we could re-edit the movie over many, many years. And, you know, we went on with our lives and even the idea of Chief Zabu, which we had so many hopes and dreams for, and then it never got distributed and the final cut, we didn't quite like it. It wasn't the movie we wanted to capture. So we just never talked about it again. I mean, every once in a while we say, yeah, maybe one day we should look at it. But neither of us were connected to technology. And then on a certain day, a guy named Donald Trump comes down an elevator in New York and says he's gonna run for uh, president. And Zach and I are having dinner and we are very aware of Trump. We knew him. We didn't know him personally. Well, Zach actually had met him because Zach and his wife were introduced to each other by Blaine Trump, who had married one of Trump's brothers. Oh, wow. He was a big socialite in New York. But he, he was like a buffoon in the 80s. So we knew him and uh, modeled the character somewhat on him. We said, well, look, we made a movie about a New York real estate developer who wants to have political influence. Um, maybe we should take another look at the picture and just cut out everything we hate. And we don't care if it's a 20 minute movie, let's just cut it down to what we like and we'll throw it on YouTube. You know, it'll just, because we know that driving scene's pretty hip and a couple of other scenes are pretty hip. So all we actually had was a third generation VHS tape of the movie, which we got transferred to digital so now it's fourth generation and we learned that you could get an unemployed actor in north hollywood with a laptop to cut your film with uh, <laughs> for two hundred dollars a week <laughs> no longer 200 a day exactly so we found this very nice affable young woman uh, and we uh, uh, sat in her apartment in North Hollywood and just cut everything out of the movie that we didn't like. It, it, it came out to about 72 minutes, which we did like, and we thought it was great fun. And uh, we said, great, we'll take this movie and put it out there. And she said, you can't show this movie to human beings. And we said, why not? And she said, because you can see what it is, but it's like looking through a terrarium and an aquarium <laughs> <laughs> and somebody's bed sheet. It, 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 you can't actually see anything at this point. You got to find the negative. And we looked at each other like, you know, an old comedy team from vaudeville, like the negative. We hadn't seen the negative for 30 years. And uh, so began a couple of months of us trying to track down where could be the, the negative of Chief Zabu. And after calling dozens and hundreds of people, it was finally located actually in Zach's basement in Burbank under a pile of old tax records and laundry. And we found this, uh, these cans marked negative Chief Zabu and took it to the last lab that handles 35 millimeter in LA and told this cat the story and told him we didn't have any bread. <laughs> and the guy said, well, this is the craziest story I've ever heard. But even though you guys are an aggregate 143 years old, you are legitimate first time independent low budget filmmakers. <laughs> so if you could give me the student rate, I'll clean this thing up and transfer it to a uh, proper digital and nice. you, can make, you can match your edits and get it out there, which we did. And we took it to a guy to color correct it, who we got the same story. The guy had just come off color correcting the revenant 
And he looked at the movie, said, guys, you can't put this on YouTube. This is a good movie. I love this movie. I'll, I'll color correct this movie for free, which really? he did. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and the next thing you know, we had a movie. We uh, did a kind of little uh, a test run. We got a great review in the Hollywood Reporter. The New York Times did a story about it. And uh, all, all these kind of bloggers were weighing in. And it's a legit cult movie that... Uh, some people dig and now that you know trump is uh, the most famous human on earth mm. and now that uh, alan garfield who just died of covid actually did he um, it's it's his final role and it's his aside from one other movie it's his only role in a lead and if your listeners don't know who alan garfield is he's probably the most prominent character actor in the uh, late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, made over 125 movies, worked with Coppola, De Palma, uh, there's so many credits, it, it's a, but always as a supporting player. Yeah. The only time he had another lead role was perhaps his first movie called Cry Uncle, directed by a guy named John Avelson. And John Avelson's second movie was Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> but after making Cry Uncle, where he plays a weird B movie detective, Alan Garfield never had a leading role again. Uh, which is why I am now going to give Milo mm -hmm. a B movie task. Uh oh, okay, okay. So, our new press agent said, Who else is alive who was in this movie? Because <laughs> Zach's alive. And there's one other person, one other actor who's alive, and that actor is named. Mariana Hill. Now, Mariana Hill is one of the great actresses, unsung actresses. People may know her as Fredo's wife in Godfather 2. Okay. But she was in one of the greatest independent films called Medium Cool, which was shot documentary style by Haskell Wexler during the Chicago riots, in the Chicago riots of, I think, 1968 or 73, during the, the Democratic Convention there. Um, and it's just a remarkable film and performance. She also made movies with Elvis. She also did High Plains Drifter with Clint Eastwood. She was in the early Star Trek. So she's got all these Trekkies who chase her. And then she made a couple of real culty horror movies, one of which is called Blood Beach. So Blood Beach people are always chasing her around. The last movie she made was Chief Zabu, after which she retired from acting and moved to London mm -hmm. and became somewhat of a hermit okay. living in London. Okay. Well, when Chief Zabu had its test release, we tried to track down Mariana Hill and found out she doesn't have a cell phone. She doesn't have a computer. She certainly has no social media. So through a woman in England who had put her in a short film some years ago, I tracked down that woman, had to write that woman an actual old school letter with a stamp <laughs> and an envelope to deliver to Mariana. So it was a letter in a letter. And then I get a call from Mariana Hill, who says, oh, Chief Zabu, I remember making that movie. That was so much fun. You guys were so crazy. I want to come to the premiere in L.A. So I said, OK. Um, she said, but you got to go to my safety deposit box in Beverly Hills, and I'll send you the key and get my jewels out, and that'll be the collateral for you to fly me over to LA. So this all happened. Okay. She was absolutely hilarious, including at some point going rogue and disappearing. And we had the police in LA and Santa Monica searching for this 79-year-old woman who's about, I don't know, five feet tall, complete hippie, gypsy look, maybe 92 pounds, who doesn't have a cell phone, we found out that she had taken the bus from Santa Monica and a series of buses up to MGM because she wanted to sneak onto the lot and walk around the, MG, <laughs> the, the, the Warner Brothers lot. 
which is a movie I will be making at some point. That sounds like the, yeah, that's you. That's a movie right there on its own. Yeah. So was, exactly. she, was, she, was, was she coherent? She was coherent, extremely eccentric, uh-huh. and knowing that if she played the eccentricities, it would fuck with people's heads. I see. Okay. Like she would meet with the press and tell them that she was a Trump supporter. <laughs> and she loves Donald Trump. That he's the, and they'd say why, and she'd say, "Well, it'll be good for Chief Zabu." <laughs> that would be her punchline. Or she would, she would just. We got her a student intern who I think the woman had to be institutionalized after being Mariana's <laughs> keeper for a week and a half. So then Mariana disappears, calls me a few times just to chat, and then evaporates. And again, she has no phone, no social media, nothing. I want her to know that this movie is going to be streaming. Okay. So I'm going to give you her address. Okay. All right. And people tell me it's like like a Tony address. Okay. <laughs> and she's a real character. So I'm going to give you this address now. Okay. <laughs> it's. And now people, I don't want anyone in your listening audience to go kidnap her. And uh, oh, I will. Most- Completely cut that out, yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And then we'll get a report from Milo All right. to hear how successful he is, or if he got a pie in the face, or he has to probably most call likely me what will happen. tragic news, or uh, 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 call me saying she's at the airport and she wants another plane ticket, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want me to like try to get, like, basically, here's how you can watch this film, or just you know, get in contact with Neil. What, well, she's what's going to be on TV all, all around the world and tell her to call her old pal Neil that uh-huh. Zach and Neil want to say hi. Okay, okay. All yeah. right, I'll see yeah. what I can do. She's just, uh, and, and it'll be a fun adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and unless radio audience, podcast, we never hear from Milo again. At some point, this, this podcast will just end mysteriously. And uh, that will be why, because I went and knocked on a door, the door opened, right. and I was stabbed by, right. a, by, a, by a 90 pound, you know, 80 year old lady. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. But yeah, I was looking her up at 84 credits to her name here on IMDb. So yeah, she's got done quite a bit. Well, when we had the police, the police wouldn't look for her because they say you have to wait 24 hours before you look for a missing person. And they said, uh, is she uh, indigent? We said, well, she's not indigent. Well, where does she live? London. <laughs> How did she get to L.A.? Well, she got a plane ticket. And flew. Well, then she's not indigent. Is she insane? <laughs> and we said, well, she's kind of crazy, but she's not insane. And she's kind of eccentric. And they said, and it was the night of the World Series. So like L.A. was kind of crazy. The Dodgers were in the World Series, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and all of a sudden, this cop in the back of the station, I see he's looking at the screen, and I see he's looking at IMDB. <laughs> and the guy <laughs> says, wait a minute. She was in High Plains Drifter with Clint Eastwood. We got to find this broad. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly he cares. <laughs> Suddenly he cared, and they put out this all points bulletin wow. to find Mariana Hill. So they found her, brought her back. Yeah, well, they found her actually getting off, uh, getting off the bus. She had found her way back. It was like uh, I don't know, one in the morning. So she reported that the greatest place on earth was Rite Aid. Mm-hmm. The only problem is there's a hundred Rite Aids and she forgot which was the one near the apartment we had gotten her. So she kept getting off the bus, going into different Rite Aids, thinking that was the one in our neighborhood. And finally, the, uh, the police located her coming out of one of these Rite Aids in the middle of the night. And they gave her, you know, a royal treatment, a royal ride back home, you know, like she That's was, nice. a, you know, Yeah. Okay, so where was Zabu? So we got where Zabu was shot, but there was the scenes that take place on the island. Where, where was that? Because yeah, obviously, I'm assuming it wasn't that, on an island. <laughs> it was on an island, actually. The <laughs> exteriors, the interiors of the the radio broadcast studio are at Bard College, but the exteriors. Zach had a timeshare on an island called Saint Croix in the Caribbean. Hmm. 
So we went down to St. Croix for a day and a half and shot a bunch of exteriors, okay. all crashing in his timeshare. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's where the, the island of Tiburaco was shot. Yeah. How did this become a, a joke on Mystery Science Theater 3000? Because it was made in 1986. Yeah. Disappeared. You're just now finally getting it back. But somehow in between this, it turned yes. into a Mystery Science Theater 3000 reoccurring joke. Right. Okay. So the frame is neither I nor Zach had ever heard of Mystery Science 3000. <laughs> for a few years, well, for several years, Zach Norman would take a postage stamp size <clears throat> ad in a thing called Weekly Variety. You'd open Weekly Variety, and on page three, <clears throat> there would be a postage size ad showing Zach Norman's face. I would just say Zach Norman. And there was a postage size ad near it showing B.B. King's face with all kinds of contact information. Zach didn't have any, just his face. It said Zach Norman. So when we were developing Chief Zabu, shooting and editing it, he changed the ad to a picture of him that said, Zach Norman is Sammy in Chief Zabu with no contact information. And that ad ran for years, three years. So, but why did he have the ad running for three years? Okay, so the man is all about doing a head trip on the planet Earth. Okay. So we're editing the movie and the phone rings and it's a reporter from Newsweek. And Newsweek was a bit, was like Time Magazine was it was like one of the big weekly magazines. It's now become the Daily Beast, actually. And this reporter, who's from the Culture Desk, calls and says, "I need to get in touch with Zach Norman. I need to know about this ad that's been running for years, and now it's Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Zabu, which doesn't seem to exist. I need to talk to Zach Norman and find out what is he there." I said, sure, he's right here. I go, Zach, it's Newsweek calling. They want to know about the ad. He takes the call. He listens to the guy's request. And he says, listen, man, obviously you don't get it. You don't get who I am. I'm <laughs> a guy who hates publicity and hung up the phone. <laughs> I said, Zach, what the fuck, man? Like the guy who wants to do it, they don't, he said, why would you do something like that? He said, I just wanted to imagine what the guy's face looked like when I said that and hung up on him. <laughs> so that tells you why a guy would take such an ad. Okay. So, up to we're re-editing the movie in the valley in this a nice person's apartment uh, on a laptop. And we go take a walk on a place called Ventura Boulevard. And walking towards us is a, nice looking fell in his 30s and he's got a t-shirt on and the t-shirt is a picture of zach norman and it says zach norman is sammy and chief zabu so we go whoa man stop it what, what the what the fuck who and the guy realizes he's talking to zach norman he's got on his t-shirt because zach spells the mustache and they look looks like we go what the fuck is this he goes, Mystery Science Theater. We go, what's Mystery Science Theater? <laughs> he says, well, it's like the biggest thing. It's the thing we, everybody loves, the cult thing. And they always say, Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Zabu. And we find out that online you could buy T-shirts that say, Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Zabu. So then we reverse engineer the whole knowledge of this thing. and. Two kind of funny anecdotes that are linked to the legend of Chief Zabu, one as it relates to Mystery Science Theater, and then relates to another thing. So Mystery Science Theater has been dining out on the quote, Zach Norman is Sammy in Chief Zabu, based on, well, it's obvious this must be a shitty movie that doesn't actually exist even. So we tracked down Mystery Science Theater, which is going to do a relaunch at the time. We said, listen, we're going to, we're going to actually launch Chief Zabu. And you're going to, you know, let's team up. Let's have some fun. Let's, ha let's have some laughs. And their official response, which is not 
official, but it's official enough is, what do you mean it's a good movie? <laughs> like they see the review in the Hollywood Reporter, and they see the review from these people in Italy and in London and in New York. They go, well, that fucks us up, man. <laughs> it's a good it doesn't movie. work for him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they refuse to have anything to do with us. But the, the fan base of Mystery Science Theater is very intrigued by the whole Chief Zabu thing, and now you will be able to see it. The other place where we had the door slammed in our face is we contacted Bard College, where we shot the movie. And we said, not only did we shoot the movie there, but it's a 30-year-old, 35-millimeter artifact of what your campus looked like in 1986, because the campus doesn't look like that anymore. It was very pastoral. Now it's all filled with buildings, parking lots, all kinds of things. Why don't we do a screening there? You got to film the park. You got to let, let's, you know, let's have some fun. Yeah. We want nothing to do with Chief Zabu. <laughs> <laughs> so well, part of our campaign may be, why is Bard College afraid of Chief Zabu? I don't know. That would be my question. Like, yeah, yeah, are they are they getting like, you know, people coming, going there as like pilgrimages and taking pictures of the buildings? And I or have something, no or? idea. But wow. that that's one of those very, very peculiarities. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who shot the movie, who uh, may still be twitching from dealing with Zach and I as first time directors, did such a beautiful job, and the film looked so much better than it should look. Uh, it's a guy named Frank Prinzi who went on, I think, to shoot uh, Law and Order and shoots all the kind of um, videos that Colbert does that are kind of based on, and he's had a wonderful career, brilliant, brilliant DP, and he made Bard look just terrific. But uh, why they're uh, uptight about it, it, it can only be imagined and can only be the source of yet another smile. Yeah, that would be, that'd be something to find out. So I'm curious with the t-shirts, uh, is uh, Zach now like, hey, I need, uh, where's my royalty money from these t-shirt sales? No, so it's just like, you know what, uh, whoever's, if, there's a thing called T Public, and you go there and you type in Chief Zabu, and it says, you've heard it thousands of times on Mystery Science Theater. And Zach Norman is, now you can wear I feel like I need one now, yeah. You do need one. Hold that. Where's my chief Zabu file? I got all this crazy other stuff here. <laughs> I, I know the chief is, is the most important thing, and uh, it's been uh, sent off to uh, exile somewhere. Uh, no worries. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll track one down online. So what's, the, what's, what's happening to the film now? So you've got it edited. Uh, yeah. How are people going to be able to see it? On uh, August 7th, it, it'll be streaming on Amazon, iTunes, Vudu, Google, I'm told, for a rental price, very 1980s rental price of $4.99. Oh, you'll be able cool. to see it or buy it for like nine bucks, maybe. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty funny movie. You know, I look at it now, I'm, I'm, it, it's funny in life. It's something that was when it was lost, when it had this cut I didn't like, it was something that would actually give me the, the willies when I would think of it. And now it's something that I'm really proud of. I'm really happy that, you know, I did it, we did it, and it's out there, and there's some people doing some terrific performances in it. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's something I'm happy about. I'm really happy about it. I think uh, people get a kick out of it. It's a, it's a kind of filmmaking and a kind of comedy that doesn't exist anymore. No, not at all, yeah. You know, making a low-budget picture w that's way over-ambitious for what it could handle and much of it working. And uh, uh, there's a kind of comic timing and a style of actors and casting that you don't see anymore. Um, and, you know, even that a guy like Alan Garfield, great actor, is giving it his all in a in a lead role and and kind of having a sense that this is his shot to have a have a lead role, you know? Yeah, I was really impressed with it because I was worried uh, mm -hmm. because you know I hear mystery science the I mean I love B movies anyways so I but I was expecting like you know a, a cheesy 
poorly right. made B movie, and it actually yeah. isn't. It's actually pretty well made film. Like I, it, it is certainly better than I was expecting it to be. I was really impressed with it. Like so, good job. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, we had that reaction from a lot of people. We reached out to look at the movie, and they said, "Oh man, this is going to be just, you know, some zombie movie that's just." And and they would go, "What the hell's going on here?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's got some good scenes in there. It's got some great dialogue, like, yeah. uh, and and uh, and yeah, the two of them play off each other just fantastically. Yeah, and you know, and it's a, a story. You know, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's right, blah, 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 but it is a story about a bunch of businessmen trying to rip off a third world guy, a leader, and it uh, you know, not to give away too much. Uh, all the businessmen come off great it's not like at the end they got their tails between their legs uh, uh for them uh hey chief zabu is the greatest thing that ever happened the only person <laughs> yeah. it's not good for is chief zabu you know um which is not unlike uh you know the guy who's in the white house right now uh, as long as it's uh, good for me it's a happy story mm -hmm. um and uh, you know i remember it uh, when we first cut it other distributors were interested in it if we gave it a happy ending for the chief and we get, you know, it's like, uh, uh, we're stupid. We're artists. No, we're not going to do that. And now I'm, I'm glad we were true to it. Yeah. It, 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 that, and then that was another thing too, because especially with a lot of films being made nowadays, everything's so dark and serious. Uh -huh. You're done watching it and you're depressed. Exactly. And, and so I love stuff like this where it, it doesn't end that way. Cause yeah, nobody ends the film really worse off than they were before. I mean, maybe a couple people do, but like, it's not depressing at the end. You, you still enjoyed the film. No, it, 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 it's kind of joyfully perplexing in yeah. a way. Um, and it's not, it's not obscure. I mean, it, it, it's out there on its sleeve what it is, the story of these characters, um, that, you know, chasing a pot of gold um, and having absolutely no preparation for functioning in the world that they want to function in um, as businessmen, as a, a, a political figures. But again, that's what we're seeing nowadays. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's also a testament to having the idea of we'll make the movie as long as it should be. Yeah, it works. It's the right length. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the right length. You know, yeah. it's, uh, and uh, a couple of things that are a little shaggy. Well, okay, they're a little shaggy. But then a couple of things are, well, I've kind of never seen that sort of weirdness. I mean, there's this weird um, scene at the beginning where this hustler is making a pitch to a bunch of businessmen about this deal to take over at Tiburaco. And the guy who's making the pitch is the great actor, Alan Arbus. Um, everyone in the room listening to the pitch who's not Alan Garfield in the role of Ben Sidney, is an actual businessman. Oh, okay. Who Zach knew, and we invited them to sit in a room and hear this pitch and ask some questions to the guy making the pitch. So, you know, there's this kind of Fellini-esque group of uh, men that you see. Uh, these, this isn't uh, central casting. This is actual guys that Zach was in business deals with at the time. And, uh, you know, they're listening and they're asking questions and they're reacting. And, uh, you know, that, that doesn't happen in a normal movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Okay, let's move on. We've, uh, <laughs> because you've been doing some producing recently as well, right? So uh -huh. you, you produced a, a short called The Diary of Being Uncomfortably Comfortable yeah. Uh, yeah. by Maria, Maria Rose Marquez. Mariah Rose Marquez. There yeah. we go. Yeah. So uh, what got you involved into that project? Because it's a very different type of project. Very different kind of project. So I've got a, a book that I did, a, a, a book for kids called uh, uh, American Gargoyles. And it's a comedy about the gargoyles on a New York building, an art deco building that... Uh, is going to be uh, here. It is. You can see it. Um, is going to get knocked down, and some glass superstructure is going to be put up. Once grand, now forgotten building, and uh, the gargoyles have to figure out how to save their building. And they're very American gargoyles. It's a businessman. It's a, 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 a skateboarder, a, a, an actor. It's 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 not you know a, a fairies and uh, mythical creatures. It's very kind of New York bickering characters on this building. One of the characters, one of the gargoyle characters, 
kind of got picked up by skateboarders <laughs> as a character they like to put on t-shirts. So on my American Gargoyles Instagram site, which is like an old man's version of doing an Instagram site, it's, a, you know, so preposterous how I do it, some people like it. Um, I had met this Mariah Marquez, who's a skater down in Venice Beach, and somewhat of a, you know, people know her. She's a, a person down there, a kind of a fashion icon, a skater, an activist, a really good person. So she approached me and said, you know, I'll do a couple of uh, little Instagram videos for you, wearing the t-shirt, and get some kids in the neighborhood wearing the t-shirt, how's that sound? I said, great, I mean, terrific, I'll pay a couple of bucks, do it. You. Then what do you want me to do? And I said, do whatever you want to do. Just blow your own mind, make yourself happy, do a couple of videos. And she did, and they were astonishing. <laughs> they were astonishingly good to the degree that these T-shirts wound up being sold in this high-end fashion shop in L.A. Wow. So I said to her, because she's got a, a fascinating life story and a great visual touch, and a very droll way of speaking because she's from the Texas Louisiana border. And uh, I just said, you know, you should make a short film about yourself in your kind of expressionistic style. Don't, you can make a conventional one if you want, or you can make something that reflects who you are. And uh, I'll give you a couple of bucks and a couple of bucks to do it. And you can do it from archival footage that you've created of yourself um did you do it and she did it and it kind of blew my mind i think it's a wonderful 13 minutes of energy and expressionistic filmmaking and as a grown-up and a and a dad it's somewhat harrowing what her story is um and then ultimately uplifting and told in a, a very unique fashion. I mean, it starts like you think it's some pretty girl Instagram post, and a couple of minutes in, it makes a sharp turn and goes someplace else. And uh, it got picked up uh, by this uh, a festival here in LA. Uh, put, uh, the Venice Institute of Contemporary Arts puts out a festival called the Fine Art Film Festival. This year it was online. So they asked to show the movie, and then the, they awarded her Best First Time Director. And then from that, it got picked up by Documentary Weekly, which is a, a Paris-based streaming service. And you can see it now for free on uh, Documentary Weekly. If you go to their website or their Instagram page or Facebook page, uh, uh, and you can see this movie, The Diary of Being Uncomfortably Comfortable. And it, uh, I don't want to give away because it actually has a story. <laughs> it actually has stuff going on where you go, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's fascinating uh, to, to yeah. watch it and to, and to hear the story of her life. And it, yeah. makes, it makes you kind of want to like continue to like find out how her life is going to end up because she's very young. Yeah. And she's, you know, just kind of living and skating and getting yeah. by. And so it would be interesting if she does something years from now to see yeah. what happened to her. So hopefully she'll s stick with it. Yeah, And, and what I, why I really encouraged it also, because she is very talented and she's got a great eye and a great rhythm. She cut, she, you know, shot it, edited it, created it on a, on a broken iPhone that she has. I mean, it's, uh, you know, in her, in her van where she lives. Um, but I really wanted her to be able to capture this moment of her life and put that on film because what any of us are is going to be different two years from now, 18 months from now, 18 years from now. Um, and you could go back and say, I'd like to capture who I was, but you can't really do that. And, you know, also uh, uh, from a kind of uh, almost protective point of view, LA is a town where there's a lot of creative people. And that's a wonderful thing. But a lot of creative people also uh, parasite on people's ideas and lives and stories. And I knew, not, not like I thought, I knew somebody would come along, meet her, hear her story, and do a bad version of it. Mm. And I've seen that happen, particularly to young women who have interesting stories. 
probably half a dozen times. And I wouldn't want to name the movies that were made where the, the friend, the girlfriend, the muse, or whatever was promised to be the lead, wasn't. Then some star became the lead in a version of her life that's a bad version of her life. Yeah, yeah. You hear those stories, that's for sure. Yeah. So I want to protect Mariah Marquez from that. So you mentioned American Gargoyles. What's happening with that? Yeah. Another kind of do-it-yourself project of mine that I worked on for a decade, probably, till I finally got it together. Um, and, uh, you know, also, oddly enough, with a Trumpian-type character in the middle of it, because uh, there's a guy named Donald Hairdo who uh, wants to <laughs> knock down this great old building and put up a, 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 a gigantic mirror so he can look at himself all day long. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so the book kind of got some traction, got a great review in the New York Times, oddly enough, them again, and uh, is, you know, out there and can be bought on, you know, at Amazon. It's, it's a lot of fun. People seem to dig the book. Uh, and uh, I was approached by a kids media company that wants to option it. So we're talking about what that deal would be and what they would do with it. Uh, there's some conversation that it, they may want to do it as a one hour special, which kind of lends it to that. I mean, it, 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 as a kid's book, it breaks every rule. It's 40 pages. It's really crazy rough drawings. All the dialogue is written in my handwriting. <laughs> I, I didn't know you're supposed to do cells on top of the stuff. And if you want to make a change, you know, so the changes are made with a scissor and white out and scotch tape, which you can actually see on the final product. And I think that's the reason that people actually sort of like it, that it's kind of crazy and it has plot twists in it. And did you do the, the art yourself as yeah, well? Yeah, I did the art. Yeah, I did the art. So it kind of took me back to my being a kid in Queens, New York, being an artist uh, thing again, you know? Are you going to do uh, additional uh, sequels to it? Um, yeah, well, people ask that. I, I, I'm kind of hot on a new idea that sort of came out of a very minor character in the book. Um, so I may go in that direction unless there's some real desire to do you know, uh, the British gargoyles or Austrian gargoyles or, or American gargoyles too, their adventures continue. But uh, the book itself is, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's kind of a, a hoot. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to have done that. And, and that's another thing that took about, you know, 10 years to find a publisher and then uh, a, a kind of very, you know, odd, fun publisher in New in, in L.A., of all places, but such a New York story, who does lots of hardcore stuff. I mean, real hardcore fiction. I said to a friend of mine, hey, yeah, we're looking for a kid's title. <laughs> and that's how. And the person who he said that to was that woman who gave me my first job. Really? To that. Yeah, we're still friends. Oh, wow. And he's back in the publishing world and was doing business with him. And he said, hey, I'm looking for a kid's title. And she said, I may know what you're looking for. Oh, that's great. That's lovely how like those yeah. uh, you know, long lasting friendships kind of work yeah. themselves around and stuff. I know. I know. How much of your day do you spend writing versus just like promoting and doing all of the, the, the other work that you have to do to, as a writer? Well, I would say a lot less writing than I should, but I always do a lot less writing than I should. You know, I, I get up really early with all kinds of ambition. And if it starts happening, I could just go for hours and hours. If it doesn't, I'm the most distractible person on the planet. And I'll, you know, wander around the city or go through these crazy old books of mine or go, you know, find paper that's blowing down the street and read a story, you know, or, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, then usually late at night, I'll get back into it, you know, or, or late in the afternoon. If I'm on a project, I'm working on a, a I mean, it's, you know, people are listening, they're going to think this guy works a lot. I mean, this guy never works, but it just so happens now as an old man, he's getting jobs. Uh, you know, I'm working on uh, uh, writing a TV pilot for a producer, which just got turned in about a week ago. 
that's sort of around the clock. You know, that's a deadline. That's, you know, people are real people who have jobs and need it and deadlines and stuff like that. Will it ever get made? If it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. But that was kind of a fun job. And it was a fun job to have to get up to do it. And you got to get it right. And you send the draft in and they call you and they give you, you know, pages of changes and notes that have to be then delivered at five o'clock that uh, afternoon, you know, because, uh, and you also know that you're competing with 12 other projects they have in development. So you got to be real professional and you got to be, take the knowledge you've acquired over 30 years of doing this of what it means to be professional. And a lot of that is separating out, well, they're going to ruin my beautiful script and dream and say, I can't believe somebody's dumb enough to treat me like a professional. I'm going to be so professional and honor the fact that they're paying me to write something, you know, um, and make them not dumb that they gave me a job. There were many times in the past, you know, where I would bungle things by being too much the artiste. And what I found with doing American Gargoyles or producing Uncomfortably Comfortable or doing the re-edit of Chief Zabu with Zach, it's okay to be an artist when you're not expecting to make any money on it and you're doing it for the love of the artistry. But when somebody's paying you to do something, it's a team effort. And in the past, I may not have been the best team player. And I'm glad I'm still alive to have learned how to be a little more of a team player and know that the people who are paying you to do something, in the past it would be, well, if they're paying me to do something, they've got money, they don't have a problem. Now I realize that they're paying you to do something, they're under a lot of stress, because they're not paying you out of their pocket. They got the money from somebody that they're paying you. Mm -hmm. So being able to recognize that the people you're working with are under a lot of pressure themselves makes it, even if you disagree with them, to recognize what their problem is and couch your disagreement in different terms. It can't just be, dude, don't you get it? What's the matter with you? Don't you get it? You got to start out with, I could see you're having a problem with my vision. <laughs> Let's figure out what the problem is. And often when you take that attitude, if you're writing a movie or a TV show, the problem is something that's very fixable. It's an attitude of tone. It's an attitude of what's happening in the industry that week. It's, an it's not personal insult of, I don't think you're a good writer. It's, I'm having a problem with this because of this now. And it's either, and then you get to choose well, let me remove the problem by changing it completely, or let's see if this fixes the problem. And now you're working as a team on the thing. And you also, or not you, but I've also learned, you know, I didn't know I'd have a long career until I had a long career. And it's funny because people could look me up on IMDb and they'd say, man, this guy's having, what a great company, he's had a great, he's got nothing produced, what the hell's going on here, you know? But it goes, stuff I've rewritten or weird show that's not baked into it or the things that you know you really thought would happen you know a series at HBO that got canceled a week before for one reason or another you know I mean there's lots of stuff where I was able to sort of make this weird living um, but you're going to get a lot of shots to get up at the bat if you're understanding that it is an industry you know it's if you're a journalist the, the, you know, your editor just beats you up all the time before your story gets into print. And that's just part of the game that you're going to get beat up. You know, I've done some journalism and you're just going to get beat up by the editors. You know, first time I did a journal, I couldn't believe it. What do you mean you want to change something, you know? And then you found out, well, no, yeah, I mean, things changed. You got to cut out 500 words. Uh, uh, it, it, once you adjust that to working in the uh, film business, you know, it's like, Okay, you know, it makes it easier to function as a writer and you're not so precious about the stuff when you turn it in. If you're not going to be that precious, you can get the work done faster. 
I don't know if any of that made sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And I think that's good advice too for, for people listening because a lot of writers don't realize that most Hollywood writers have written tons of stuff that will never be seen by anyone mm -hmm. that might get optioned and then end up getting shelved or yeah. any number of things. Uh, so it's, it's a hard field to make a living at. And the fact that you've managed somehow to do it for 30 years, that's, that's yeah. not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, the 30 years interspersed with, uh, you know, uh, you know, rapid heartbeat when you find that the things got canceled and uh, you're not going to get this pay that you've already spent the money on. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it, yeah, a lot of my life is get shorty, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, bow finger or something like that, you know? So uh, you see that, or you see a Barton Fink and depending on the day I'm watching those movies, I'm literally in stitches laughing or I need, need a drink. <laughs> literally, <laughs> I need to be sedated watching, you know, those same experiences because they're so close to things in my life. So uh, anything new that you're working on? You mentioned the, the script. Anything, anything else? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm r really focused on, you know, this uh, TV project and hoping that happens. Um, but I'm very excited to see the launch of Chief Zabu. I'm very excited to see what happens with American Gargoyles. I hope people will take a moment and look at this uh, movie, uh, Uncomfortably Comfortable, up there at Documentary Weekly. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm, ha I'm having fun doing a lot of stuff uh, with uh, no expectation of uh, just my kind of plodding along income <laughs> and just, <laughs> Uh, it, you know, kind of enjoying the process. And, you know, you get, again, hey, kids, <laughs> it's great to be alive. Enjoy it. It's like, it, it, you know, and, and not use the time well, like you should be working like some sort of worker bee or, you know, a carpenter ant or something. But uh, you've got a movie studio in your pocket, these phones now. And when I was coming up, everything was knocking on a door and begging somebody to recognize that you might have something to say and letting you in the door. And now you don't even have to knock on that door anymore. And you can make stuff out of your pocket and don't be afraid. The only thing that I think is bad for the younger generation is people make stuff and they post it immediately and sometimes it's not good. And so you don't have to show everybody everything you wrote. You don't have to show everybody everything you shot. You don't have to show everybody your poem or your painting eight minutes after you make it. You may want to make it and think about it and look at it and enjoy that you did it and then think about it and then put it out there. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. If you don't like it, but then you go on to the next thing. But Imagine a world, I know a lot of things are terrible about this world, but imagine the world where you couldn't ever make a script unless somebody gave you permission. And the person who would give you permission, trust me, is not someone you would like. All right. <laughs> <laughs> On that inspiring note. I think that's a good time to end it. Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> that's brilliant. So uh, once again, Chief Zabu is out the 7th of August, so uh, this will be coming out on the 3rd, so perfect, just a few days before the yeah. 7th. Oh, great. Uh, American Gargoyles, people can find it in the bookstore. Right. Uncomfortably Comfortable is on Documentary, Documentary Weekly. Documentary Weekly. And of course, you, if people want to track you down, where would they find you? Uh, probably the best way is through Instagram. Yeah, go to Instagram at American Gargoyles. Thanks. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, Neil. I sure will. Bye-bye.